ultimately our, our faith is based on on the resurrection of Jesus and there's there's excellent uh, evidence and, and arguments for that and so when we take a look at the resurrection of Jesus and uh, the claims that he made about the Old Testament I think at least from a theological perspective Christians can have confidence in what the Old Testament says because you know Jesus is God he's God in human flesh he was raised from the dead, so we can take his word on that. So there's that one level, but I think it is important for us to be able to have things to corroborate that, especially for people who are skeptical. So there's definitely value to these kinds of things that corroborate biblical texts. Our, our faith can stand up without necessarily having 100% proof that these were written at times that we would say that they were written on. Well, I'm joined this morning by Marc Francois, and uh, Marc and I have uh, an interesting Kind of connection because we at least spent I spent my high school years in the same town that Mark did and so we have crossover there and for some of you that might not be unusual but we both went to high school in a very small northern Ontario town which is relatively remote in the grand scheme of things in Ontario and so for us both to have come from there and then I think gone on to similar interest in education is a is an interesting happenstance and then i don't think it would be a stretch to say we were both kind of the only individuals on the high school track team who were relatively invested when i came in mark's a few years older than i am the high school track coach always referenced mark as the person who you know who this uh, long distance coach had to you know tell to do his own research on what a sprint hurdling looked like and then I came in as a sprinter and likewise kind of was informed by some things that weren't necessarily directly from the coach but very encouraged by the coach so some crossover there in areas of interest both athletic and uh, academic and so uh, the reason I have Mark on this morning is because we're going to be talking about the recent finds at the Mount Ebal discovery that was announced last month I believe which would have been what what month is it now it's may uh so in april of 2022 and some of the headlines and concepts that have been drawn out from that um so mark why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself what your areas of interest are and how maybe that crossovers into what we're talking about yeah for sure so basically uh when i was in school i, I focused on old testament studies and uh, with a big emphasis on on languages and so back when I was doing my undergraduate degree at Toronto Baptist Seminary and Bible College, I got really interested in Old Testament studies, a little bit in archaeology, but uh, mostly just uh, in languages, reading people like William Foxwell Albright, Daniel Bloch, especially. And I just thought that Old Testament studies was, uh, was a challenge, and so I wanted to pursue that. And basically, I tried to model the courses that I chose on types of language courses that you would have at Johns Hopkins University, which is William Foxwell Albright was. And so I spent a lot of time doing that. In terms of my actual PhD dissertation, it was on the relationship between parallel curses in Deuteronomy chapter 28 and curses that we have in the loyalty oath of Esser Haddon. So in terms of this discovery, I guess the overlap would be in terms of language, but also in terms of focusing on curses. Yeah. So if we jump into that, last month, Dr. Scott Stripling announced that he was doing a press release on this discovery from Mount Ebal. And so I have a headline from the Times of Israel, which ran this. It says, archaeologist claims to find oldest Hebrew text in Israel, including the name of God. So before jumping into that, can you explain the claims about what was found from this particular discovery? Yeah, so uh, the press conference that they had was March 24, 2022, so not that long ago, held at the Lanier Theological Library in Houston, Texas. The main person who was doing the speaking was Dr. Scott Stripling, and, uh, among other things, he's uh, an archaeologist with the Associates uh, for Biblical Research. One of the things that he does on top of the responsibilities that he has at school and with being in charge of these excavation sites, he works with a project that's called the Mount Ebal Dump Salvage Project. So just to give uh, some context on that, Mount Ebal is a mountain in Israel that today would be in the West Bank, so Judea, Samaria. And it's mentioned in Deuteronomy chapter 11, 27, and Joshua chapter 8. Back in the 1980s, there was an Israeli archaeologist named Adam Zertal who did excavations there on Mount Ebal. And so 
After the excavations were finished, there would be a lot of debris, there'd be piles of dirt that would have been discarded by the archaeological team. And basically, whenever you have piles of discarded dirt like that, there's, there's always the possibility that something was missed, that there might be something of archaeological significance in that pile. And so the Mount Evil Dump Salvage Project, what they do is they go through that dirt again, they sift it, and they try to see if there's anything that was missed, especially smaller items. And so back in 2019, they were going through the material. They found this object that we're talking about. So it's a small object that was made out of lead, about uh, two centimeters by two centimeters. The object that they had was folded. And uh, based on their experience, that they knew that this was a cursed tablet. And there would have been writing on the inside. And so since it was folded, they couldn't unfold it. They had to find some kind of a way to read the text on the inside. And so they used some imaging technology from the Czech Republic. They brought it to the Czech Republic. uh, So they'd be able to read the text on the inside without having to open it up. And so according to the press conference back in March, on the inside of the lead object, uh, there was about 40 letters. That was written in Hebrew in a very early version of the alphabet, and they would date that text to about 1200 BCE. And so this is basically what the text says. It says, cursed, 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 cursed by God, Yahweh. That's the personal name for Israel's God. You will die, cursed, cursed, you will surely die, cursed by Yahweh, cursed, cursed, cursed. So there's a lot of cursing uh, that's in that text. And so according to them, I guess the reason why this would be significant is that this would now be the oldest text that we have in Hebrew. So about 300 years earlier than the earliest current inscription that we have. And according to them, it's also the earliest mention that we would have of the name Yahweh. So and that's basically the discovery, this very, very small lead cursed tablet. Yeah, so this discovery clearly has significance to sort of the the biblical reliability and giving some credence to some of the passages we see in places like, like you mentioned, the Deuteronomy passages. And I personally, when I hear these things, I want them to be true. But if I'm totally honest, I feel a little bit um, disenfranchised because of the last, over the last five years, you know, we've had a number of fake Dead Sea Scrolls come to light. We had the debacle with the, you know, air quotes, first century Mark fragment, which turned out to not only not be new, but not first century and something while it was redated to one of, if not the earliest Mark fragment, it certainly was not from the first century. And so I I feel a, a little bit jaded when I hear pretty significant claims that have pertinence to the biblical text, because I think I've, I feel a little bit burned. And yeah. so in regards to this, because this is a, it was a big announcement, the, the press release kind of came out and there was some advertisement beforehand. I know I received an email from a friend who a couple of weeks before it happened kind of said, do you know anything about this? Do you know what this is? And I, I had no idea. But in regards to that curse tablet, you, you mentioned, you know, there are these areas in Deuteronomy chapter 11 and 27, as well as the significance of where it's discovered in terms of the the site of Joshua's altar to begin with. Why would the presence of this particular curse tablet be significant at Mount Ebal specifically? What would that hint towards in terms of some credibility to the biblical text that we find in Deuteronomy? Yeah, so... Uh, yeah, maybe we can start off by just talking about what a, what a, what a curse is, because uh, that's really important for Deuteronomy 11, uh, 27, right. uh, 28 as well. And so basically a curse, this is the probably the simplest definition that you can have, curse is a, a prayer to God or some kind of higher being to make something bad happen to someone else, right? So it's just a, basically a prayer. Two types of curses that we have, just generally speaking, we have unconditional curses where you basically just want something bad to happen to the individual or to the other party, nothing contingent about it, praying to whatever God it is to make something bad happen. But then you have conditional curses, uh, which are, I think, a little bit easier for people to swallow. It's basically the idea that, you know, they're praying to God or some kind of higher power to make something happen based on something that they could potentially do in the future. And so you would often see this in monuments in the ancient Near East, for example, where 
the person who had the inscription made would say, if anyone takes my name off of this monument or erases this inscription, may this God make really bad stuff happen to this other person. We find curses like this in the Old Testament. Probably the, the biggest chapter where we see these curses in the Old Testament is the one that I worked on for my doctoral dissertation, which is Deuteronomy chapter 28. And basically those curses are conditional curses that would happen to the people of Israel if they didn't keep the terms of Deuteronomy chapter 28. So obeying God, staying away from idolatry, the things that are mentioned in that central law code uh, in the book of Deuteronomy. Now, if we go to Deuteronomy chapter 11, it mentions there that there was supposed to be some kind of ceremony that was done that would involve blessing and cursing. And so there would be some blessings that would be made on Mount Gerizim, which is pretty famous for that being the place that would have been sacred for the, the Samaritans. And then you have cursing that would be done on Mount Evil. And so according to the press conference, that's significant because we have a curse tablet that was found on the mountain where they had these curses in Deuteronomy chapter 11. Deuteronomy chapter 27 is also significant. It mentions that half of the tribes would have to go on Mount Gerizim and uh, deliver blessings. Uh, half the tribes would go on to Mount Ebal, so the one that we're talking about to do curses. There's a little bit of debate about what blessings and curses that's talking about. Deuteronomy 27 doesn't actually give us any blessings. We only see curses. And so I think most people would say that's, that's probably talking about the blessings and curses that we have in Deuteronomy chapter 28. The key thing, again, though, is that Mount Evil is associated with curses, again, and the discovery was a curse tablet. Joshua chapter 8 is basically just saying they did all of those things that we were commanded to do back in, in Deuteronomy chapter 27. And so, yeah, so there's some significance there. I guess the other area of significance as well is that... Um, you know, before this cursed tablet was discovered, the Israeli archaeologist that worked on the site believed that he had found the altar that was built by Joshua that he was commanded to build in Deuteronomy chapter 27. And so basically everything fit in terms of the description. The Israelites were supposed to set up a pile of stones with plaster on it, with writing from God's law on it, from Deuteronomy supposed to build this altar and sacrifice on it and rejoice in the presence of the Lord. They found basically the remains of animals that would have been used in Israelite sacrifices on this altar. And so this is where that cursed tablet would have been, you know, situated originally. So again, where they found it was in these discarded soil, this discarded dirt that they had. And so that dirt would have originally come from right near that altar. And so, yeah, it's supposed to be significant because, again, the, uh, that's where that altar was discovered, but also because Mount Ebal is associated with curses. Now, one issue, actually, there, there's, there's two issues. One of the issues that, that's a little bit problematic, I'm sure we'll get into that a little bit later, is the material that it was found on. So it's found on a lead tablet, and there's plenty of examples of lead tablets that we have that have curses on them. But they're normally found from the Greco-Roman period. And then the other problem is that the curse that we have in this lead tablet doesn't really match up with any of the curses in Deuteronomy 27 or Deuteronomy chapter 28. So, yeah, Mount Ebal is associated with cursing in this one-time ceremony that they were supposed to be doing. But whether or not that's the same type of curse that we have in the lead tablet, that's maybe a little bit more debatable. Mm, yeah, that's helpful. And um, <clears throat> even reading about the the discovery by uh, Zertal, I think there's a lot of credibility to that being Joshua's altar. Like you mentioned, that there's a proliferation of sacrificial animal remains that you would find from a, a Jewish Semitic context. You know, there aren't sacrifices of pigs. There are sacrifices of the kosher animals that you would expect. And even pagan altars tend to have steps. And as we see, you know, in, in the Torah, the, the altars of the Lord have ramps, and that's exactly what they found. So I think there's 
there's definitely credibility to establish that that was an altar. Even if I read a thing that Zertal wrote where he said, well, it, it could actually be a lookout tower. And I think he's, yeah. you know, trying to hedge his bets and not have anyone really push against him to say unanimously, this is Joshua's altar. And he says, well, you know, it could be a lookout tower, despite the fact that it's not on that high of a hill, despite the fact yeah. that it's not actually that big of a structure. But I think he's, you know, he's trying to make sure that yeah. he's not coming across as biased, which I find interesting because that's not what I'm seeing. Not that he, you know, has to say that, but that's not necessarily what I'm seeing from this current discovery in terms of you know, trying to couch its statements so that it's not saying something over and above what the evidence actually admits. Yeah, yeah. Now, and I, I think the 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 ultra discovery, I think, um, is definitely exciting. It's interesting. And I mean, part of the thing that's interesting is that when you take a look at the Old Testament, Mount Ebal, apart from Deuteronomy 11, 27, and uh, Joshua chapter 8, it's not really you know, mentioned as a sacred site, right? So you can make an argument about, you know, Bethel and other places and their stories that are associated with that, that, you know, they, they let us know that during, you know, the Northern Kingdom, those were sacred sites. There's no really, re you know, big reason to connect that with Mount Ebal in terms of sacred sites in the Old Testament. And so the fact that it's there is significant. The other thing that's significant from my perspective, you know, someone really focuses on Deuteronomy is that uh, Deuteronomy chapter 12 mentions the fact that there was supposed to be that single place the Israelites were supposed to worship where God would inscribe his name. And in critical scholarship, that's very often seen as a cipher for Jerusalem. And so the idea was, you know, back in the 8th century, maybe during the time of Hezekiah or a little bit afterwards, for a number of different reasons, they decided to centralize Israelite worship. And to maintain the mosaic fiction, they said, you know, the place where God would cause his name to dwell or inscribe his name, depending on that, how we want to translate that. And they would say, well, they're, they're saying this is from the time of Moses, but they're really talking about Jerusalem. And so, but there are some people who would say, well, you know, when we actually take a look at the one site in Deuteronomy, where it says that people are supposed to worship, that one site is that site that we're talking about on Mount Ebal. And it, it, I mean, there's all, all that evidence for Israelite sacrifice. And so it's possible that, you know, Deuteronomy chapter 12, uh, it might be referring to one site at a time, and maybe this was that first site where the Israelites were supposed to be doing their worship. And so that wouldn't prove that Deuteronomy is earlier, but it would definitely, you know, make people think, well, you know, this idea that it's just a cipher for Jerusalem, that might not necessarily be the case. And there's very good reasons um, in other places of Deuteronomy to say that that's probably not the case. Right, for sure. Earlier, you mentioned the language that was used within this particular artifact, the, this proto alphabetic Hebrew text. What do you make of that in particular on the tablet? Yeah, so I mean, uh, I think there are a couple of things that I would want to uh, say about that. As Speaking of someone who's not an expert in epigraphy, but I'm, I'm interested in that. I think the first thing that I would say is I, I found it a little bit strange that they called it a, a proto alphabetic text. That's the term that Scott Stripling used, and I think it was the, point, the, the wording that they had on their slide as well. Mm -hmm. The problem with that is that if it's proto-alphabetic, that means that it's not written in an alphabet, right? Proto, you know, in this case, you know, meaning that it would be a precursor to the alphabet. And so I don't think that's what they're saying. They're saying that this is actually an alphabet. And so I think what they're trying to, you know, the term that they probably should have used, and they did use it a little bit later on, was that it was uh, proto-Canaanite right? A proto-Canaanite alphabet, which means that it would be a precursor to the alphabet that was used by the Canaanites and Phoenicians. And so just the, the language of proto-alphabetic is just strange. It's not standard, and it's just a little bit confusing. I guess the next thing that we'd want to say about it is that there isn't really too much that we can say about the text, because they haven't given us the full text. And so the only piece of the text that we have is a drawing of one of the instances where the name Yahweh appears. And again, I'm not an expert on epigraphy, but when you take a look at it, you know, one of the letters does look like a yod in terms of the way that uh, it would have been written back then, you know, taking the proto sinaitic alphabet as a model there. The middle letter definitely looks like a hey. You can see that it kind of looks like a person who's worshiping. And then the next letter kind of does look like a, a wow. 
but that's, that's a drawing that they made from the text. Until they actually released the text, the entire thing and actual pictures of it, it's hard to know what to make of it. Are they interpreting it properly? Is the drawing as clear or is the actual inscription as clear as the drawing? It's, it, it's difficult. Maybe one other thing that I would mention as well is that calling it Hebrew might be a little bit problematic. I guess it depends on the perspective that you're coming from. At that early of a date, was Hebrew really that distinguishable from the other dialects around them? Even much later than this, so closer to you know the time of King Ahab, uh, we have the Misha Stella. I mean, Moabite and Hebrew aren't really different. You take a look at Phoenician. I had to work on some Phoenician in my doctoral dissertation. You don't really have to learn Phoenician. It's, it's basically Hebrew. Uh, and so can we really call it Hebrew per se? I guess the only way that we would, uh, the only reason why we'd want to call it Hebrew is because of who they would say would be responsible for writing that text. And so if it was um, Hebrews that were responsible or Israelites who were responsible for writing the text, you might be able to say that it's Hebrew. The name Yahweh, if that's the actual correct reading on the, on the inscription, that would lend credence to the idea that this is, um, you know, that it was produced by Hebrew speaking people, but probably more accurate to say if, you know, if, if their rendering of the inscription is accurate, that it's a Canaanite text that could be a precursor to Hebrew, but uh, we can't really distinguish Hebrew from the other dialects that clearly at an early date. And for the listener who may not know, the, the name that God describes himself as, what's comes sometimes called the divine name or the tetragrammaton, is the Hebrew letters yav hey vav hey. So we pronounce that in sort of a modern recreation as Yahweh. And like you said, Mark, this text has yav hey vav but it's missing that last hey. Do you think that that has any significance whatsoever in terms of extrapolating conclusions about this particular find? Uh, not really, because, um, you know, when you take a look at divine or names that you have in the Old Testament uh, that have a theophoric element, so, so an element that has to do with the, the name of God, sometimes it only has those uh, mm. three letters in it. You take a look at the inscriptions that were not the inscriptions, but papyri that we have from the fortress at Elephantine in Egypt. And so these are texts that are written in Aramaic from about the 400s BC. Some of these papyri were written by Jewish mercenaries that were down there. They, they referred to him as, as Yaho or something along those lines. And so uh, the lack of that final consonant wouldn't really be that significant for determining whether or not it's the divine name. Okay. Great. Based on what you do know, what has been made available to the public, what do you think is legitimate and what do you have reservations about concerning some of the headlines and things that we see described for this particular find? Yeah, so right now I would say that I mostly have uh, reservations. Some of the reservations have to do with the actual text itself or the discovery itself. Uh, but I'd say most of my reservations have to do with the implications that have been drawn from what they say was in the find. So maybe I'll start off with some reservations uh, about the find itself. So like I mentioned before, I think, you know, one thing that would raise some concerns for me is the material that it was written on. And so like I mentioned before, we have all kinds of examples of cursed tablets that were made on lead, but pretty much all of them come from the Greco-Roman period. And so if you were to ever look up a book or a journal article that had to do with lead curse tablet, you would be uh, talking about things that were found in the Greco-Roman period in different areas around that. And so that, that doesn't mean it's impossible that it could have been uh, written on that using lead. It's just a little bit strange. And they even mentioned that themselves, that uh, uh, it was strange to find that on lead, but they would also say, well, there are examples that we have of writings that uh, were made on lead from that time period. And it fits the type of lead that would have been mined at that time or that would have been used at that time. So for me, that just raises a bit of a red flag, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's not a valid thing. Again, the, the other reservation that I would have for personally, I just, I just wouldn't want to get too excited about it at this point, just because they haven't published their full findings. Until we have the full text, until we have uh, actual images of the inscription, and until other epigraphers have a chance to look at it, we can't really say anything with, with much certainty. So it's completely possible that what they have is right, 
that the rendering that they have of the, of the inscription is, is completely accurate. That, that's definitely possible, but I think, you know, like you said, given some of the other examples that we've had of these sensational discoveries, you know, we wouldn't want to be disappointed too much. Now, in terms of the people who discovered it, I think that uh, they do have integrity. I don't think this is something that they would make up just to be able to find claims. I, I, was, I was reading just some comments uh, online, I think, uh, yesterday, and they were saying different things about the, you know, the people who discovered this, just throwing ad hominem arguments against them. And, you know, they're evangelicals and everything like that. And I, I don't think that's a valid way of arguing anyways. I mean, you have to attack the evidence, not the individual. But these people have integrity. They want to make sure that their reputation is maintained. Uh, and just the way that it was discovered, it wasn't something that was found in some cave or on the antiquities market. They found it in this uh, dirt that came from that, uh, that excavation from the 1980s. And just they had to do really minute work to be able to sift through that. For me, it's just not plausible that someone, you know, made this up. You know, they made their own cursed tablet and then they threw it in that pile on the hopes that someone would discover it. And there's no way that uh, they would have lied about where it would have been discovered. So just on that level, I do trust their integrity. I would say, though, reservations that I have about uh, some of the implications, I think those are a little bit more. I'll just mention uh, a couple of them. One of the things that was mentioned at the press conference, this was by Scott uh, Stripling. He said that to no longer argue with a straight face, face based on this discovery, that uh, the biblical text was not written until the Persian or the Hellenistic period, many higher critics have said. And so the idea there is that there are some people who are involved with historical criticism who would say that the Pentateuch, for example, was written during the Persian period, so that would be about a thousand years after the time of Moses, or the Hellenistic period, which would be even later than that. There are critics who will say that. And the idea that he has is, well, because they discovered this curse tablet, it shows that those people can't be right, that the Pentateuch wasn't written at such a late date. A couple of problems with that. I mean, one problem is he didn't say Pentateuch, he said the Bible. And uh, there definitely are parts of the, the Old Testament that were written during the Persian period. I mean, that's the time setting or the time period that it's set in. So uh, you think about Zechariah, uh, you can think about Haggai, uh, Esther, uh, and uh, Nehemiah, Ezra. Those are all set in the Persian period. So uh, I think he just wasn't being very specific at this point. I think he meant the Pentateuch uh, could have been written at an earlier date. The, the bigger problem, though, is that the discovery of this tablet doesn't actually tell us anything about when the Pentateuch was written. The only thing that it does is it makes it more plausible that uh, it could have been written at an earlier date, so closer to the time of Moses, if the only criterion that we're thinking about is the issue of literacy. So if, if, if the argument is, well, you know, the Pentateuch had to have been written during the Hellenistic period or the Persian period because no one could read or write back then during the time of Moses, then, you know, if that's the only argument, then this would lend credence to the idea that uh, the Pentateuch could have been written back then. The issue, though, is that's not the only argument that people used for a late date for the Pentateuch. There are a number of different uh, arguments that people use, and we have inscriptions that are much older than those periods anyway. And so it doesn't really do anything to prove the date of the Pentateuch. It just lets us know that, you know, if everything that they say about the discovery is accurate, that there was reading and writing at, at an Israelite site back then. So it makes it more plausible, but it doesn't actually prove anything. And uh, a little bit later on in the press conference, they actually say something like that as well. So I think some of the wording that they had might have been sensational at the beginning of it during the presentation, and then they moderated it a little bit uh, afterwards. Another reservation in terms of implications uh, Scott Stripling, he said this, the epigrapher said something a little bit different. He said that the curse that we see on this tablet would basically be a curse where the Israelites were calling upon God to make bad things happen to them if they broke the terms of the covenant. And so he's saying it's basically the same kind of curses that we have in Deuteronomy chapter 28 maybe Deuteronomy chapter 27. He, he tries to line up the curse along with those curses. I don't think there's enough text in the inscription to be able to make that claim. The, the curse, the wording that we have, assuming that the wording is accurate, is completely different from the kind of curses that we have in Deuteronomy chapter 27 
and, De and, and Deuteronomy chapter 28 and the ones in Deuteronomy chapter 11, the curses are completely different. We don't know, is this a curse that's, you know, done, you know, on behalf of the people of Israel? Is it an individual? Does it have anything to do with God's covenant? Curses are all over the place in the ancient world. You know, for inscriptions, sometimes you have these these curses on tombs. So if you disturb this tomb, you get the gods make bad things happen to you. Uh, there are curses all over the place. And so just because, you know, there were some curses in Deuteronomy 11 and 27 on that mountain, and there's curses in this tablet, it doesn't mean that they have anything to do with each other at all. So that one for me, is a little bit questionable. And the epigraphers basically seem to have agreed with what I'm saying. The epigraphers, one of them said that maybe this is a legal text. Maybe there was some kind of verdict and a death sentence was given. That's possible. I have no idea, but there's not a lot of text. It's, it's two centimeters by two centimeters, 40 letters. We don't really know what the context of the curse actually is. Another one uh, that was mentioned uh, by one of the epigraphers, that this is a discovery that only happens once every thousand years. And I was thinking, well, I don't think archaeology is being around for that long. I mean, you do have uh, Constantine's or Constantine's mother doing something like that. But I mean, to say this is a discovery that's made once every thousand years seems a little bit strange, especially since there aren't that many thousand years that we have between now and uh, the time of Moses. So I just thought that was a little bit sensational. It is, I mean, if if this tablet does prove to be what it what they're claiming it to be, I think it is a very important discovery, but a once in a thousand years discovery sounds a little bit strange to me. Considering the fact that archaeology formally only really goes back to Napoleon. I mean, that was, that was certainly not a thousand years. So that might have been a bit of a hyperbolic statement. Why don't I just for for the listener just explain that. So you mentioned that this discovery was found with the process of sifting, and particularly yeah. wet sifting is how they described it. And so I've actually seen some critique of pointing out that this is not a legitimate way to discover things. And, and I think that that's one of these critiques that is is unfounded. If for no other reason, then we've actually found quite a few pretty important discoveries in the, the land of Samaria and Judea in Israel through this process. In fact, in, in 2015, the seal or, or bulla of King Hezekiah was discovered in this way, this little, it was, uh, I believe it was three millimeters thick. And it was a soft piece of clay, which had this impression that said something to the effect of like, this belongs to Hezekiah, son of Ahaz, king of Judah. And that was a, a pretty big discovery. And that was a discovery that was done through wet sifting in some material that was pulled from the Temple Mount. And so mm -hmm. uh, I think not all critiques are created equal. And certainly I think there's room for reservation without trying to you know throw everything out the window, the baby with the bathwater in that Absolutely. regard. In light of all that, how do you think we as the broader Christian onlooker, how should we assess this claim or even claims that come out in the future about big finds that are, are said to have had or are having significant impact on things like the validity of the biblical text or the historical reliability of particular narratives in the Bible? I mean, I, I, I would say maybe just uh, just from the theological perspective, I think uh, ultimately our, our faith is based on on the resurrection of Jesus. And there's, there's excellent uh, evidence and, and arguments for that. And so when we take a look at the resurrection of Jesus and uh, the claims that he made about the Old Testament, I think at least from a theological perspective, Christians can have confidence in what the Old Testament says, because you know, Jesus is God. He's God in human flesh. He was raised from the dead, so we can take his word on that. So there's that one level, but I think it is important for us to be able to have things to corroborate that, especially for people who are skeptical. So there's definitely value to these kinds of things that corroborate biblical texts. Our, our faith can stand up without necessarily having 100% proof that these were written at times that we would say that they were written on. Um, and so maybe just in terms of uh, things to watch out for, I'd say one thing that we would need to be careful about is is being overly skeptical about uh, claims that are made. So once once these texts have been deciphered and published, there, there is the tendency for some people to just be extremely skeptical uh, and to 
basically, you know, hedge their bets or even go the opposite direction and just say, this has nothing to do with the biblical story or biblical text. And I think the temptation is that if we try to distance archaeological finds from scripture, it makes us seem a little bit more intelligent. And so the more skeptical you are, uh, the more you try to shoot down the Bible, the more intelligent you seem. And I think this is a temptation that you see you know, with lots of people, but you do see this in archaeology quite a bit, where there are some things that shouldn't be really debated, and people are still saying, well, we don't really know for sure. And so, I mean, one example, uh, there's a really good book, um, I think it's a short uh, Oxford Introduction to Biblical Archaeology by Eric Klein, I think that's the title, something like that. But there was, you know, this, this inscription that we have from Egypt that mentions a pharaoh named Shashank, if that's how we pronounce it. And that kind of correlates to, you know, Shishak in the story of Rehoboam, and there's lots of corroborating evidence for that. And one of the things that he said in his little book was a little bit shocking. It says, however, you know, after saying how all of this matches up, he says, however, it remains unresolved whether the Egyptian Shashank is the same as the biblical Shishak, although most archaeologists and biblical scholars believe this to be the case. And I'm thinking, with all of that great evidence, and pretty much everyone says it's the same person, and everything matches up, why are you being a little bit skeptical in the way that you're wording things? And there's even better examples than that. So that's one danger. And uh, we can even fall into some of that ourselves where we might just be a little bit too skeptical even after everything's being published. So I don't think we should want to go in that direction necessarily. The other side of that is maybe being a little bit too gullible or overly excited before these things have been corroborated. And the reality is that once these things are published, there are going to be other epigraphers that take a look at it. They'll, they'll look at it and say, well, that doesn't look like a yod. No, that doesn't look like a hey, or that doesn't look like a wow. Or maybe the, we shouldn't be reading it that direction. Maybe it's right to left instead. And uh, there'll be different, or the word division might be a little bit different. And so some of that isn't necessarily valid. I think sometimes people, you know, they go over these texts again, and they're a little bit too skeptical in terms of saying, well, you know, this doesn't match up. So they en end up coming up with implausible word divisions and things like that. But, you know, we, we need to make sure that we're a little bit cautious, that we don't get too excited and hang too much on that until people have had a chance to, to really look at it in detail and see whether, you know, the more eyes look at it, you know, the more confidence that we can have that it's something that's authentic or not authentic. And at the end of the day, we don't really want to look like, well, you know, we just get so excited or we just believe anything that people tell us. No, we want to base, you know, the claims that we make on on evidence that uh, anyone should be able to accept that evidence, whether they are a believer or not. And then one of the other big dangers, kind of like I mentioned, is is overstating the significance of new discoveries. And I think, you know, very often we want to have, you know, these knockout punch arguments for uh, the historicity of the Old Testament or, you know, the accuracy of Scripture. And the reality is that, you know, some of these things might help to corroborate what we believe, and, that, and that's fine, or it might fit in with what we believe if, if what we're saying uh, is, is true. In the end, you know, these issues are a lot more complicated than those things. And so we need to make sure that we rest our faith on, on things that are a little bit more solid. We don't want to just be people who just say, well, we just trust everything on faith, so evidence doesn't matter. Evidence uh, really does matter. The evidence that we have, especially when it comes to the Old Testament, we have so little evidence compared to what we might have in the New Testament in terms of archaeological discoveries, so many gaps in our knowledge, and that can work towards someone who's more skeptical for them to be able to make crazy claims, and it can also work to help us have confidence in the Bible as well. There's just not too much we can say with the limited amount of resources that we have. So I would say let's not overstate uh, the significance sometimes of some of these discoveries that have been made. That's very good advice. You know, being too eager one way or the other, to be too eager to be hyper-skeptical or too eager to be just accepting everything at face value. And as part of the broader apologetics community and the work that I do, sometimes I'm a little bit frustrated <laughs> with the eagerness that I do see in a lot of type apologetic type publications when they jump on this thing or that thing and then draw conclusions that are like, well, obviously this proves A, B, C, D, and E, and F. And I'm like, uh, I might prove A. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think we do need, we need to be realistic. And even just to speak to your first point about how big of a hat should we hang on the the reliability and sort of making sure that our faith is true 
in terms of archaeological evidence, it certainly, like you said, it can inform things, but it's not a a sure and fast proof. I think even, you know, if you were to go back in time and find some a scribe in the ninth century and say, hey, who is King Sennacherib? And if he was a, a diligent scribe, he would open up to what we now call Second Kings, chapter 18, and talk about in the 14th year of Hezekiah's reign, there was this guy, King Sennacherib of Assyria, who Hezekiah, when he, when he was king of Judah, sent a message to Sennacherib at the city named Lachish. Now, he would have had no archaeological evidence for any of those things, right? There would have been no excavations that he could point to or anything. Since the ninth century, almost a thousand years later, uh, we have discoveries of the Lachish relief in the British Museum. We know that this story is corroborated, but that informs this story. But if we didn't have that, would we have to throw out this this description in Second Kings? No, we, we wouldn't, because we we understand, especially like you said, in terms of how Jesus refers to the law and the prophets and the writings talking about him and the the strength and confidence we can have in that that we don't we don't it's great that we have all these archaeological discoveries yeah. but we don't need them in order to believe they inform our faith without either knocking it down or completely building up the foundation on the basis of why we do believe or don't believe where do you think we should go from here in regards to i guess this kind of is is related to the last question but where do we as christians go from here in this, these types of conversations about big discoveries or things that inform our faith as, as believers in Christ? I, I would say that one of the things that we should be, do, do, be doing is, uh, is simply be patient, I guess, and just wait for everything to settle and, and see what happens. Yeah, not get too overly skeptical, not get too excited, but just have some patience for these things to, to be published. And uh, I would say that, you know, as someone who trusts in the reliability of the Old Testament, I think we should be expecting more great discoveries that will corroborate some of the things that we have in the Old Testament. And so I think it's exciting. I think uh, the work that they're doing over there is, is very valuable. And I believe that, you know, for those things that are verifiable, those things that would have left remains, I expect that those things will eventually be discovered. Now, we have to be cautious because some things will never be discovered. Will we ever find archaeological evidence for Abraham? Why would we find archaeological evidence for Abraham? I mean, did he leave anything behind? Probably not. And uh, did anyone else write about him? Probably not. And even if he did leave something behind that said, you know, Abraham was here, what are the chances that we would find it? Uh, we have to be realistic about what archaeology is and what can be found. I do believe, based on discoveries that have been made up to this point, that when we do find more things, that they're going to serve to corroborate the biblical text as opposed to as opposed to tear it down. And I think a lot of the arguments that people make to tear down the biblical text, a lot of that's based on on an argument from silence. And so I just expect more and more discoveries to corroborate some of the things that we believe. And arguments from silence range from uh, worst to uh, even worse. So we need to be careful of those too. Yeah, well, thank you for taking the time. I really appreciate it, Mark. If uh, if people want to hear more of what you do, I know you have a, a YouTube channel. Well, why don't you share a little bit of, about that so that others can maybe find some of the, the work that you do out there on the interwebs? Just in terms of the stuff that I have available online, basically it's kind of limited to two things. The first thing is I am doing a, a free online grammar of classical Syriac, and so spend a lot of time writing that. And based on emails I get, there's a lot of people that use it from different countries, and it's yeah been able and it, it's it's gone pretty far, which is, which is quite nice. So I, I enjoy that. So not everyone's interested in Syriac. Some of the couple of the videos that I have, and maybe some ones that I'll do in the future, might show some of the significance of that. And I think it, it is something that's exciting. Syriac's a dialect of Aramaic, and Aramaic is the language that Jesus spoke, and uh, so to be able to read the New Testament in Syriac, especially in those places where the New Testament quotes Jesus in Aramaic, and you have a Syriac text quoting that, you know, what does that actually look like, and basically it's identical, I find that stuff interesting. So there are some videos about that, and I do have a couple of videos on Old Testament textual criticism. I hope to do some more on those. I uh, haven't had too much time to be able to work on those things. But if anyone's interested in Old Testament textual criticism, check out those videos. And if you have a specific question, 
about uh, an Old Testament text, uh, some of the evidence for that, the critical um, or the different readings that we have, just shoot me an email. You can find my email on, uh, on my website. Just look for my name and hopefully it should show up. There's also a politician in Britain with the same name as me. So go down and you'll be able to find my website eventually. Shoot me an email, ask the question, and that's a good place for me to start with ideas for, for videos. And so yeah, that's basically us. what I have in mind. Remind us what your website is. I believe uh, it's www.markfrancois.wordpress.com. Something okay. along those lines. Great. No, I appreciate that. I appreciate the the nerdiness with the languages. There was a point in time where I kept going back to my academic committee and I had to stop because they kept telling me to learn more languages. And after a bit of a, a crash course in Sahidic and Boharic in a Coptic, which is uh, for the listeners who don't know, it's basically ancient Egyptian for argument's sake. And I'd gone back and I'd, I'd shared some of what I was learning. And one of my committee members said, you really should learn Syriac. You know? And I said, okay, we're, we're going to draw the line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can only learn so many languages in, a, in the space of one year. So really, really appreciate that. I hope people take it advantage of that. Is there anything else that you, you would like to say in regards to, to this topic? I think uh, we've covered it pretty well. I'd say one of the best things that we can do is simply, you know, read the book of Deuteronomy, you know, get excited about the book of Deuteronomy. I mean, we have information from there that I believe is, is totally trustworthy. Read it. It's not boring. It's, it's quite exciting. Even those, uh, those first passages, there's something that we can learn from those passages as Christians that's uh, really valuable for us today. That's great. Well, thank you so much for being with us. Appreciate your expertise and knowledge on this particular topic. Thanks for having me.